All right, guys. I'm so happy to be with you here today. Thank you so much for having me. Capital on Stage is such a unique event, and it's a fantastic opportunity for me to talk to you with an outsider's perspective. I say outsider because I'm not an investor, and I'm not a founder. What I represent is the market analyst perspective. Today, I want to talk to you about something a little different than standard market analysis and market trends that you might have heard of from other people. About a month ago, I participated in another pretty special event. I had the opportunity to present on the main TED stage at the annual TED conference. And I was there to talk about the rising power of hackers and how they are changing social and political circumstances all around the world. In fact, I claim that hacker culture at large could be a source for fantastic, creative, innovative, and productive changes in the world in the years to come. And this was, I admit, a bit of a contrarian per, uh, reference or perspective, if you will. I'd like to tell you something about myself to explain why I'm so fascinated with hackers. I'm often asked, how did I get into the world of hackers at all? It's not a trivial or natural choice for a young woman, perhaps. But the short answer is Angelina Jolie. In fact, I was 14 at the time. She starred in a 95 movie called Hackers. And when I saw that film, I realized that all of the things that I love doing, scanning ports on networks and finding vulnerable servers online and looking for back doors, it's actually called being a hacker. And hackers can do amazing things in the real world, not just in Hollywood. And you know, if Angelina Jolie can do it, why not try it myself? So I decided to pursue a career in the security industry. And since then, I've had the privilege and the opportunity to work with some incredible organizations, leading technology companies and security agencies here in Israel and around the world. I've learned a lot about the fast-moving security and technology industry. And now, as an analyst, I'd like to share with you one of my primary conclusions about this dynamically changing environment. Technology has already impacted our lives right now in the 21st century in so many ways, from our politics, to our media, from our culture, to the way we conduct ourselves and the way we do business. And our lives are only going to become more wired, not less so. And that means that the people who can break boundaries, the people that can use technology and do with it whatever they like, have incredible power. And it doesn't have to be a criminal or a negative thing. In fact, it could be a fantastic source for innovation. And this is the lesson that a lot of the tech giants that now lead Silicon Valley have learned in the past few years. And I'd like to share with you some of these cases and incidents. But of course, I'm not the first one to suggest that hackers can be great innovators. A few people said it before. People like Paul Graham, who uh, published a book of essays in 2004 called Hackers and Painters, in which he spoke about the creative aspects of hackers and why they make them so special, yet so vital, in the technology industry. If you don't know Paul Graham, that's OK. But a few months after he published this book, he went on to found Y Combinator, to date one of the prominent incubators and tech accelerators in the world. And he still feels the same way about hackers. In fact, he said that even if you take into account their annoying eccentricities, their disobedient attitude still represents a net win. And I feel the same way. And so while the term hacker might be controversial or usually comes with ideas of criminals or some people in the basement breaking the law, I'd like to suggest that different perspective of hackers as innovators. And let's start with a story of how hacker ingenuity has been finding creative uses for technologies in the most unexpected of places for more than 40 years. I don't know if you recognize this little toy, but this toy whistle, this blue plastic toy whistle, uh, was packaged inside Captain Crunch cereals in the United States in the 70s. And one radio hobbyist called John Draper discovered that when he uses this whistle, it produces a very specific sound, 2600 hertz to be exact. Now John knew that 2600 hertz is exactly the tone that AT&T used to signal a long-distance trunk line was available for another call. 
So he took upon himself the nickname, the hacker nickname of Captain Crunch. And he started exploring the boundaries of the North American telephone system with this simple whistle. And of course, he got a lot of long distance free calls. That same year, 1971, he caught the attention of a couple of other hackers in Berkeley, California, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. In fact, they met him at his dorm room at UC Berkeley, and they asked him to learn the secrets of phone hacking, or freaking as it was called. Wozniak used that knowledge to build the blue box device. This is an actual one that Woz built from the museum. These blue box devices was basically digital synthesizers in a small form that could reproduce those signals and tones so specific to the phone system. Woz built them and Jobs sold them, $170 a pop from the back of their Volkswagen van in California. This was in fact their first business endeavor together. And today, the, the both recognize, or uh, of course Steve Jobs recognized the importance of this endeavor to their continued relationship. Wozniak said he has never been more proud of a circuit that he has ever designed. And Jobs said very simply in an interview from 98, if we hadn't built those blue boxes, we would have never created the Apple computer. So hacking can create some of the most innovative companies around the world. And of course, uh, if we look at it, it turns out the Steves were hackers. But what are the key qualities that make hackers tick? I think you'll find these are things like curiosity, <coughs> intuition, thinking with audacity, or chutzpah, as we call it here in Israel. It's the true Israeli renewable resource. Forget solar energy. We never run out of chutzpah, right? But more than that, it's coming to things with an open mind, thinking about challenges from different perspectives, and using what hackers call the black box approach meaning they're setting aside any paradigms or predispositions of what they might think of any technical challenge. More than anything, it's accepting risk and failure are just part of the game. They're only stepping stones on the way to the next challenge. Now, if we think about this, these are the core values of innovation. These are what the VCs here and the founders here would like to have in their companies, in their portfolio. I think uh, that's a very special, special perspective. And indeed, you could say that the hack away is an approach to building that involves continuous iteration and improvements. That hackers believe that something can always be better and that it is never complete. And they just have to go out there in the world and fix it, often in the face of those who say it is impossible or are content to stick with the status quo. Now, I would love to tell you that these are my own original words, but actually, they were written by this guy, Mark Zuckerberg. It seems that Zuck still remembers his early days as a dorm room hacker in Harvard in 2004. And in fact, he included the, his letter called The Hacker Way as part of Facebook's letter to investors on the day of their first initial public offering in February 2012. But of course, Facebook and Apple are very well-known hacker success stories. What about something more recent, more up-to-date? Well, let's look at WhatsApp, recently acquired by Facebook for a staggering $19 billion. It's a little-known fact that Jan Kuhn, one of the co-founders of WhatsApp, was indeed a pretty prominent hacker in his time. And here he is partying with a group of hackers called the Woo Woo, he was a part of this Woo Woo research group. They're hanging out at DEF CON, the world's largest hacker conference. This picture was taken in 1999, and Yan is the guy standing to the right of the Asian gentleman signaling the W, or the Woo Woo sign. If you don't recognize him, that's okay. But Doug Song is one of the co-founders of Arbor Networks. In fact, the Woo Woo research group was in charge of, was responsible for a lot of security advisories and hacks at the time but they were also the home of Sean Fanning, the original Napster, and a, and a bunch of other innovators. And here they are together celebrating the success of WhatsApp just a few months ago. So now that uh, they've all come together, Jan could, could share with them that the many hours and days that they spent chatting on IRC, on Internet Relay Chat, actually inspired the way he designed WhatsApp. And if you look at WhatsApp, it has a lot of the features of that 90s chat system. Let's talk about something else now, 
hardware hacking, because there are incredible innovations there as well. This little device started a multi-million dollar company recently chosen by Fast Company as one of the most influential entrepreneurial endeavors in the world. Now, you might not have been able to buy this because this is called the Wave Bubble, and it was an academic experiment by a Jewish-American engineer called Limor Fried. She was a student at MIT at the time, and when she proposed this project, of course, her professors told her this would be incredibly illegal because what this little device does, it's called the Wave Bubble. It's a personal radio frequency jammer. It means that anyone could turn it on and he would have a bubble of electromagnetic wave uh, blocker or jammer, if you like, preventing cellular, wireless, Bluetooth, or any other type of radio frequency uh, radiation from reaching him, or more importantly, for leaving his devices and being caught by perhaps interceptors. Now, this was an academic project, and Limor couldn't go ahead with it because it was illegal according to the FCC. But when she made it known to the public on her blog, she was overwhelmed by requests by engineers and hackers for the blueprints and the parts that she used and how could she build it. She realized there was an incredible potential for a hardware hacking market. She started a company called Adafruit Industries, which is now doing a lot of business selling engineered kits, do-it-yourself electronic kits that anyone could use at home to build their own gadgets with Arduino and Raspberry Pi and a bunch of other things. And most recently, she made history as the first female engineer on the cover of Wired. And like I said, Fast Company has nominated her to be one of the most influential entrepreneurs of recent years. But there's a more interesting story here yet. A couple of years ago, uh, in fact, in 2010, Microsoft was getting ready to launch their new Project Natal uh, Kinect sensor. This was literally their game-changing motion sensor device for the popular Xbox platform. I don't know how many of you here are gamers, but I'm a big fan of the Xbox myself. And this is indeed quite a revolution in video gaming. Now, when they, are, they were getting ready to, to put this out in the market, Microsoft said, we're going to work very closely with law enforcement and security vendors to make sure nobody can tamper with this device or hack it. But at the same time, Limor and her friends issued an open challenge for anyone who could develop open source drivers for the Kinect, making it possible for people to use the Kinect with a simple PC, even with a Linux box, not just with the Xbox. And they awarded $3,000 to the person who could build those. Well, those drivers were out almost weeks after the Kinect was first launched. And within days, Microsoft started thinking about it. And you could say perhaps they went a 180 on their 360 because they realized that what this means is that more people can use their technology to do more things. And this is something basically any company would like to happen. And so Microsoft issued an open SDK for anyone to build software to play around with the Kinect, effectively inviting hackers and engineers. Completely different approach to what they were publicly saying just a few months before the launch. Now they've you know, got a lot of good credit for that, and uh, there's a worldwide community of creative hackers building Kinect hacks for the Xbox, and Microsoft is only making more business because of it, so I think it was the right decision. But companies sometimes also make mistakes, even companies in the same space. And this is what happened when another guy called Geohot managed to hack the Sony PlayStation platform. And by hacking in this context, I mean that he rooted the console. He made it possible for anyone to run any games on their device, even if they were not exactly bought at the store, if you know what I mean. And Sony didn't like it, but they even, they even liked it less when George put all of the information on his, on his own personal blog, and thousands and thousands of people around the world started using this to run any kind of game on, on the console. So they decided to sue him, and more than that, they went after the personal IP addresses of the people that visited George's blog. This quickly began as a legal battle, but it transformed into a story of an evil empire aggressively fighting the lone agitator, a poor hacker that didn't even have a car to his name, let's face it. And so the annoyed hackers decided to retaliate, and they did something incredibly criminal and very painful to Sony. They hacked into the Sony PlayStation network, and that bre breach 
cause the network to be down for 20 days. That downtime meant a loss of more than $150 million for Sony, which is a lot more they could have ever hoped to get from George. And so Sony decided to settle, and George got a job with Facebook, of all places. Still a, a good home for hackers, it seems. But uh, let's talk about another innovative company that we mentioned before. What about Apple, right? So today, everyone says that Apple is hacker safe. There are no viruses for the Mac, and it's a much more safe ecosystem. Well, that's not absolutely accurate. And for the past seven years, hackers have been competing in a contest called Pwn to Own, which means hack to own, where they are being awarded a MacBook Air or a new iPad depending on the speed of how fast they could break into those devices. Now, of course, other companies and other technologies have been hacked in this competition as well. But here's the interesting thing. Apple doesn't prevent it, but they also don't participate. They've decided to take on this very silent approach towards this competition. And what they do every year is before this competition happens, they issue out an update to their iOS, to their software, making sure that they get the best testing possible from guys that actually have the incentive to do so without Apple even being around to see what happens. Later, they use the results to fix their products. And I think that's a good, good, good example of a different approach that a company can take. They also did a similar thing when they learned about this guy. His name is Comex. His real name is Nicolas Allegro. He created the Jailbreak Me tool for jailbreaking iPhones. Perhaps some of you in the audience have even used it. And it's hugely popular. When Apple found out his real name, they didn't sue him. They gave him a job. And I think that is a fantastic example, again, of how a company can use this power instead of fighting it. And here is Comex with Geohot and his other hacker friends hanging out and celebrating at DEF CON, the world's largest <laughs> hacker conference, just last year. So remember those faces, because you might see them signing off on billion dollar deals, just like Jan Kuhn and his friends from WhatsApp. So at this point, it should be almost obvious that hackers are synonymous to innovation. Why fight them? And indeed, a lot of companies, more conservative companies, are trying to figure out ways to use this innovative energy in a safe way. And one solution they've come up with is actually setting up hackathons. I'm sure you've heard about these or even participated in them if you're a startup founder. These are marathons of hacking or weekend-long informal events with music and beer and a lot of popcorn and Red Bull where engineers, designers and hackers are encouraged to work together for a short term goal or even come up with innovative ideas for which they win cash prizes. In 2012, I believe, a project called Group Me started at the TechCrunch Disrupt Hackathon was later acquired by Skype for $85 million. So hackathons are also creating a lot of innovation around the world. And everyone from the BBC to the White House to insurance companies and financial technology organizations, even real estate companies, are rushing around to organize such events. And that is a pretty good way if you're a conservative company to deal with it. Another way is, like Facebook does, is championing the internal hackathon idea in which they bring their own engineers together and pitch them with challenges and encourage them to f come up with new features. Even the like feature that we all like or dislike on Facebook was a product of one of these hackathons. And every year they host an annual Hacker Cup event, which is a competition for engineers all over the world to fight with each other, and the best one gets a job at Facebook. So great way to recruit talent. But what about fighting real hackers? Of course, Facebook gets hacked all the time. It gets ha hacked all the time from people from all over the world, including this Israeli guy, Nir Goldschlager. Nir gets paid a lot of money to hack Facebook. But here's the interesting thing. It's actually Facebook that pays him, and he doesn't work for them. This is because Nir participates in a clever thing called a bug bounty program. And tech companies like Facebook and Google and Mozilla and Microsoft are all offering bounty rewards for independent hackers who can prove they actually found a vulnerability in that company's code. And this is a way to crowdsource security, if you like, because by offering these incentives, the hackers can find things that your developers have never even knew existed. And the bounties are paid with an anonymous credit card like this, 
that helps people feel comfortable if you want, they want to stay in the shadows. But here's a hacker that didn't want to stay in the shadows. This is Khalil. He's a Palestinian hacker from the West Bank. Last year, Khalil found a serious privacy, privacy flaw on Facebook, enabling him to post anything on anyone's wall. Khalil attempted to report this to the company's bug bounty plan, of course. But because, because of some language difficulties and barriers, his report was not acknowledged. He was so frustrated, he did the only thing he could do, post on Mark Zuckerberg's wall. Of course, this got their attention, and they finally recognized the bug and fixed it. But because he hadn't reported it properly, Khalil was denied the bounty usually paid for such discoveries. Thankfully for him, a group of sympathetic hackers crowdfunded more than $13,000 to reward him for his discovery. And this raises a vital discussion about how we create incentives for hackers. But there's a bigger story here still, and that's the message I'd like you guys to keep with you today. Even companies founded by hackers, like Facebook was, still have a complicated relationship when it comes to hackers. So obviously, for the more conservative ones, it's going to take time to realize the true potential. But here are the good news. For you, startup founders, you're on your own. You could embrace the hacker way every which way you like. You can own it. And that is my advice to you, because here in Israel, we also have that incredible home advantage. Many of us are already secret hackers, or maybe not so secret. So we can go out there to the bleeding edge of whatever innovation is happening in our field and take it home and create a leading edge company. So own your hacker spirit. Be one with it. Encourage it, never mind which uh, part of the technology industry you're in. Hackers are not only in cybersecurity, they're in a lot of other fields. And I truly look, look forward to see the type of innovations and changes for our future that your companies are going to produce. Thank you very much.